Mr. Garlis, thank you so much for seeing us. Um, um, we really appreciate it. We came from Delaware, so we're really happy to be here, and thank you for giving us your time. Thank you for stopping by and visiting our facility. It's really beautiful, and uh, we watched all the history, how you had to move it here, and just uh, the challenge that it, that it took to, to get where you are, all through life, really, but um, it's really a beautiful establishment, so thank you for giving that to the public. Yeah, well, we've been this 43 years, and, uh, and I've given a tremendous amount of my personal uh, belongings to the place. A lot of the stuff that you see in here I've had way back into the 50s and even the 40s. Yes, I wanted to know, um, you have, excluding the cars, what do you feel is your most prized possession in here? All the way, you know, down to the, you have the marbles, you have, you know, you have your whole life is sitting in here. You're clearly a very nostalgic man. You have this whole, you have this whole beautiful facility. Um, what in here, what, what little piece, not a car? This is what I really surprised you. That's what I want. <laughs> 1938, I handmade a birthday card. Uh, I love it. Yes. Over it too. <laughs> okay. Me too. I signed it. Happy birthday. Aww. And my, I gave it to my mom, and she saved it. She saved all it. All those years. Mm -hmm. and she came here. She never liked drag race. Mm -hmm. She never went to a drag race. Mm -hmm. But she came here when her husband died mm -hmm. in 1997. She came here and became a greeter. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. So. But she couldn't. Mm -hmm. But she saved that car mm -hmm. and she gave it to me. Yep, she gave it right Put back. It in a frame. And it's over in the parlor in the antique building. Yes, we saw that. I take a million dollars for it. Absolutely. That's wonderful. That I thank you for sharing that. Um if it's your first autograph, it really is. Oh my Six goodness. Years old. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah. That's my most prized profession. That's wonderful. Gosh, so touching. <laughs> All right. So speaking of strong women, you've had a, long, a lot of strong women in your life, starting with your mother. Um, it's got to be awfully hard to be a mother watching her son run around like, like you did. Um, and then, of course, your wife, your first wife, the same, you know, both of your wives. And to support a lifestyle that you have, um, you have to be strong. Um, and then you have two daughters uh, and you know, grandchildren, great grandchildren, I assume, correct? Yes, five. Five. <laughs> God bless. And a great great grandson. Oh, wow. Amazing. What's his name? His name is. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I got you choked up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Yeah, right. <laughs> Brayden. Brayden? Yeah. Okay, very nice. So, um, having all these strong women in your life. Uh, what would you say, okay, um, let me back up just a little bit. Being a man, you, being all, all people do this, but especially men, we look at the other person doing it and determine how we could do it better, different, how, what he did wrong, this and that, you know, you kind of compare yourselves. As a man looking from the outside, what advice could you give uh, women, women racers, women mechanics? Uh, any woman who is now in a position where she feels empowered and strong and confident enough to do these jobs that are typically done by men, looking from the outside as a man, what's the advice? Well, it's the same advice that was given to me by, by my stepfather in 1950. You've got to follow what you love. You're only going to pass through here once. Mm -hmm. And even if you're here 100 years, it's going to be a very short time in regards to eternity. Mm -hmm. So do what you love while you're here. And you will be successful at it because you'll spend so much more time in it. Mm -hmm. Here I am, I'm at work, I'm 88 years old, I have plenty of money, I don't need to be here. I love to be here. Mm -hmm. This is what I do. Yep. And that's my advice to women, and of course, it's much better now because the laws have all changed and women have equal footing with men now. And so don't let anything discourage you. 
Mm-hmm. Do it. Yep. I, I completely agree. It, it, how you got here. Yes, absolutely how you got here. And it feels damn good to live your life, not just be in it. You know, push the limits a little. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Um, hmm. I've, always wanted, I've always wanted to leave everything that I've touched behind me in better shape than when I got there. Yes. That was my goal. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. Use something up and then somebody else have to fix what I've mm-hmm. done. Most people ruin some of the stuff that I left behind. Mm-hmm. Yep. So speaking of fixing things, um, a big part of what we're doing is trying to find stories of the times when it wasn't so easy to get your hands on the things you need. Um, going into the Salvation Yards, junkyards. I spent the last three days, I've seen about 2,000 cars in the last three days, and about 1,500 of them came from briar bushes in the middle of the woods, and it was one of the best experiences I had. I have a classic story for that. Wonderful. In 1956, I had a flathead dragster. Mm-hmm. It had Model T rails for the frame. And I tried to put a Chrysler engine in that. And as soon as I went to one race, the frame bent. Okay. <laughs> I went and followed the advice of the older, the old man, which to me, you know, I'm in my early 20s. Mm-hmm. And the old man was a 38, 40 year old guy. Yes. So one of them had a sprint car. And he said, Donald, what you need is a 31 Chevy frame rail. Use those for your frame rails because they're just, they're lightweight, they're heat treated, mm-hmm. and they got that kick to go over the axle. Okay. So I called around the wrecking yards in Tampa and out on West Hills Avenue, the old man running the yard said, yeah, I got one of them frames that will $35 for it, but you've got to take it out. Okay. <laughs> yep. Well, I'm working in a body shop, mm-hmm. and you work till noon on Saturday. Yeah. There's one car in the family, and nobody's rich now. We're all just making a living. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Bucks a week mm. as a pen pay in that kind of profession. Mm-hmm. And so Saturday afternoon is all the errands with the wife and the groceries mm-hmm. and whatever has to be done mm-hmm. around the house. Mm-hmm. And Sunday was the day for me to get the chance. Mm-hmm. So at 8.30, in the morning, I arrived at the East Hillsboro, West Hillsboro Auto Parts, mm-hmm. and uh, I have a axe, a big sledge, a huge chisel, and a small box of hand tool. Okay. In okay. And I walked to the gate there, and the old man is standing there, and he says, Sonny, do you think you're going to be able to get that chassis out of that mm-hmm. shovel with those meager tools you have there? I said, yes, sir. He said, give me the $35. I gave him the $35. He walked me out into the field out there, and it was turned over on its side in the bushes with no engine and transmission. That mm-hmm. was helpful. <laughs> yep. Some work I wasn't going to have to. Yes, yep. <laughs> At 3.30 mm-hmm. that afternoon, mm-hmm. I drove out of that junkyard with those two side rails. Okay. All the cross members had been removed. It's all riveted. I chiseled every rivet. Wow. Hundreds and hundreds of rivets wow. were chiseled out and then driven out with a punch. And mm-hmm. the two side rails were now perfect. Okay. I went out of that junkyard and that old man, 38 or 40 years old, was just <laughs> standing there with his mouth open, just gaping. He couldn't believe what he'd seen. But I was a person that was Everything. Absolutely. And when I started to do something, you couldn't get in my way. And that was all started from a very early happening to me. In March of 1934, okay. I'm two years and two months old. Okay. I still got a diaper on. In fact, I have a picture of me the next day after this episode okay. in the front yard with my mother. Okay. My father took me. Okay. <laughs> he thought he had bought, bought a dump truck load of used bricks. This is the Deep Depression, okay. 1934. Mm-hmm. And uh, he delivered those bricks and he wanted them dumped up by the house 
where the fireplace was going to be built. And he would hand chip the mortar off the brick and mm -hmm. each brick. Of course, that became really fancy <laughs> later in life. <laughs> yeah. The way poor people did it. Exactly. Yeah. It had been raining, and the guy with the dump truck was afraid to get up that close to the house because it wasn't, it was none of it was paved, but at least it was more solid out there. Mm. So he, my mother wanted him up there, and my father wasn't there. He was at work. And of course, my mother was barefooted and in just a sack dress in the 20s. Mm -hmm. And men didn't pay any attention to women, mm -hmm. what they said in those days. Mm -hmm. She could have screamed off, she wanted you to do nothing. Mm -hmm. He dumped the bricks out on the road. Mm -hmm. oh. okay. And it was about 500 feet away from where my dad wanted the bricks. Mm -hmm. He came home and he was fit to be tied. Yep. He started, he was real bad about cussing. Mm -hmm. Calling the guy everything under the book. Of course, my, my mother, you know, woman, you know. Yep, everybody's to blame. Yep. Put him up in, mm -hmm. trying to explain she could do it. And then all of a sudden he stopped. He got this brilliant idea. The boy can move the bricks. Mm. Two, two years, two months. That's me. <laughs> and my mother screamed, the baby can't do that kind of work. <laughs> she told her the baby, which is three months old, had just been born December the 30th, 1933. Happy belated. <laughs> actually holding the baby, and I think to myself, what baby do you got the baby? <laughs> Talking about me. <laughs> right. I never, ever in my whole life considered myself young. Mm. Isn't that funny? That's amazing considering how young of a life you live. <laughs> about this story, about when it happened, most people don't even remember these days. Mm -hmm. And my father was a, had been an engineer at Westinghouse, and he and five other men invented the electric iron and the electric fan. Oh, wow. But then he came to Florida because the air wasn't good up there in Pittsburgh, and that time mm. the, of the country was just pure coal smoke. Yeah. So he mm -hmm. came to Florida for his health. Okay. He went out to the pile of bricks with my little red wagon, and he took his slide rule out of his pocket. And he took his watch out of his pocket, and he looked at his watch. He put his watch back in his pocket. He put five bricks in the wagon. He went to the brick pile. He came back to the wagon. He took his watch out of his pocket. He looked at the time, put it back in his pocket, took the side rule, did a few things like this. I didn't know what he was doing. And he said, the boy can move the bricks in seven days. If he works every day from daylight when I leave oh, till no. sundown when I come back from work, in seven days he can have a brick smoke. And I was already thinking about where I was going to make the little room. <laughs> I was just so excited. Yes, you get to make was your dad just proud. Screaming at the top of her lungs, Bill, that's that's cruel. The baby can't do that. He says they're never too young to learn how to work. And look where that got you. <laughs> I my entire Sounds rough. And but... my work ethic on that one deal. I moved those bricks in five days. I oh, destroyed the wagon. And my father went into town and uh, went into the nice section of town. I rode up and down the streets with a fancy home until he saw a real nice wagon out by the side of the road. And they got a newer one for right. the boy. Right. And this, this old usual was a Chitanic was scratches in it. Yes. That was oh I was such a nice piece. I had it for years and years. It's too bad I don't have it anymore. Yeah, it should be here. I <laughs> you should not. go on a hunt for the missing red wagon. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 that put me in this mode. My father told me when that was all over, he said, see, he said can't is not in your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. There is no such word. Mm -hmm. If you want to do it, you're going to be able to do it. And my wife, that was her famous line. The minute somebody said, you can't do that, <laughs> and she looked right in my eyes and said, you said the magic word. Yep. <laughs> you don't know what just happened. This little lady understands that. <laughs> One of those people that don't tell me I can't do it because I'm going to do it. That's how she got here with me. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a picture up on the wall of me by that flathead dragster. 
And that's Lake City, Florida, August 1955, and I won the race. I won everything. I won top of the In those days, you ran all the dragsters, and then you ran the coop and the roadster and all the different ones. So there was one car that was faster than anybody mm-hmm. there, and I won that. And I was in this little big small club called the Strokers. Okay. And so a couple of weeks later, we had a meeting. Of course, all the Strokers were there, naturally. Naturally. <laughs> How could and you we miss? We had a little meeting, and they had all kicked in some money and bought a little tea set. Little, you know, the little teapot, okay. and the little creamer, and the sugar, and some little cups. And they presented that to me and my wife at this meeting. I wasn't any kind of officer or anything. I was just one of the guys. Okay. And I'll never forget that. The, the big, tall, blonde, blue-eyed, good-looking president. <laughs> I was about 110 pounds, you know. And uh, he looked at me and he said, we've, we've got this little tea set for you commemorating your win at Lake City. He said, I guess you'll retire now. <laughs> That's I, why it was tea. I said, Gene, I said, why would I do that? He said, because you will never beat the Californians. In other words, I beat everybody from here, yeah. but I never yeah. beat the Californians. <clears throat> and my wife in the back of the room said to herself, she said the magic words, and that was August of 1955, and August of 1957, at Cordova, Illinois, the World Series of Drag Racing, I beat the California champion that had never been beaten by anybody. They hired him to come back to, to get people in the stands. Yeah. And they gave him to me for the first round because I was going to be easy. Yep, and easy out. Nobody knows this guy is from the other side. On to the next round. Mm-hmm. And they, it stunned them. Mm-hmm. They, we come down the return road and the, the president of the association, Jim Momoa, mm-hmm. this is the ATAA, not the NHRA, came out and met us at the head of the Charter wrote and said, in all fairness to the world champion, we're going to have to see that again. <laughs> wow. Already again. Oh, God. I love it. I love it. Okay. I'll we'll go again now, or do you need to set up some time? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. That's I, great. I, I, and, of course, that was such an incentive to me. I, I, I knew they could. This, this guy's picture was hanging on the wall in my garage. That's my hero. Wow. He was the first car over 160. Okay. And in the tenth, I became the first car mm-hmm. over 170. Mm-hmm. And I never looked back. The rest Just, of the yeah, with a lot of notches along the way. <laughs> So, um, speaking of your wife, and kind of for one more moment, keeping it uh, kind of on the women's side, because of course I'm, I'm put, I, I p- appreciate strong women, women who, you know, whether they're there supporting, or they're in, they're in their side by side at the start, wherever they are. I like, you know, I appreciate strong women. No doubt, your your first wife was an amazing supporter of you. Do you think? Secretly or openly, did she ever kind of want? Was she ever kind of rooting for Shirley just because, you know, she fully supports you, but would just as a woman, did she ever say anything about that? No, she, she really didn't. She was a really a homebody from the old school. Okay. And she was against the girls driving. Oh, okay. Of course, I was for it too because in those days they sat right back there with the engine mm-hmm. and they could have been burned seriously. Mm-hmm. She never thought that women should do that kind of dangerous stuff, but see, that was her personal mm-hmm. things. And uh, she applauded Shirley for what she did, but she she never never wanted her to beat me. <laughs> but she did chair for Shirley in the racing. The other, other men. Yes. Okay. She That's a very that fair balance. A, a real pie. There was one woman before Shirley, too, you know, I don't know whether you know about her, Barbara Hamilton, that had the, I blue, do not. the, blue, the blue car, her blue car is in his museum. Okay, it's I must have seen it then. Large, uh, little, uh, uh, Willis. Okay, okay. And, and she was the first woman licensed to drive a supercharged car, and then, after they gave it some thought, they pulled her license. Oh, okay. Did they have a reason? All, went through all kind of letters and 
meeting. Mm-hmm. They finally got our license back. Did they? Did they have a reason? I mean, you had to. Whether it's red tape they or or, or real. Shouldn't drive supercharged cars. Well, I know they thought that. That was the reason, though. <laughs> Dangerous. They had okay. for the same reason. Yeah. Well, Shirley, her husband actually came to me. I was in the chassis business since 1964. Okay. And they, and uh, John Muldowney, her husband. Help Shirley get into my car. They wanted to sit in it and see how it felt. They really liked it. And they gave me a deposit to build her mm. a slingshot dragster. Mm-hmm. And the drive home from Lebanon, New York, I thought about it and all the bad publicity I would get if she got really, she was a good looking woman and if, and she, if she got burned, you know, it'd be mm-hmm. horrible. And so I sent her a deposit back. I said, you know, I really don't think you're the driver of these kind of cars. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't thinking of it as, because she didn't even want it for a fuel dragster. She just wanted a small mm-hmm. you know, C drag. Mm-hmm. And so she bought one from somebody else and they did real good. And then she got into a funny car. Coletta got her into a funny car. Mm-hmm. And then uh, she borrowed the guy's top fuel dragster and brought it to Cayuga, Canada, where I was match racing Tommy Ivo. Okay. Came, the, the drivers have to sign off on your license. Mm-hmm. What do you think that? I, I don't know those specifics. So anyway, <laughs> also Coletta was there because he was kind of like her boyfriend, you know. And uh, she came over and said she was going to try to qualify for a top fuel license when I watched the runs. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and, and then she went over got Ivo, and so everybody watched her make the three runs. And uh, But everybody was reluctant to sign the license, but nobody wanted to be the first mm-hmm. one because they're going to get a lot of mm-hmm. EFAs from the other guys. Mm-hmm. In those days, the weight of the driver made a lot of difference. And, I didn't have that. That was a question. The average driver. Right. Yes. Well, that was a tenth of a second. It was just that she went to the line within the bank. Mm-hmm. So I signed off on the license, and uh, then Ivo signed it, and Claire signed it. She got her license. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, I mean, I see a lot of people get licenses, you know. Okay. And, and I've seen people talk about how they were going to do all these things, and it never happened. The sport's tough. It ain't, it's not an easy sport. Mm-hmm. If some people like me are looking from the outside. It may look easy because I ran a real mm-hmm. simple operation. I didn't have a lot of fanfare. I didn't have a lot of fancy parts. But I did know something about the mechanics of the car. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I caused a lot of guys to get into drag racing. And when they got in, mm-hmm. it wasn't quite what they thought it was looking from the outside. Right. And I honestly thought when I signed off on Shirley's license that it would just be a novelty. Mm-hmm. I mean, she'd, make a, she'd run it for a while. Right. And, she'd do her thing, and, come and go. And, and, yeah. and find out that it wasn't quite so easy, you know, and then she'd just go and do something else. But that wasn't the case. <sighs> it's not, you're right. It's not an easy sport at all. Um, it just shows how much heart you have to have, to have the heart and love and passion for it. Absolutely. Um, this is very random, and it's just personal for me because I grew up in Michigan. Have you ever had any experiences in Michigan of any kind, driving through when something happened? Any experiences in Michigan? Because that's where I'm from, so I'm just asking out of curiosity. Have you ever done anything in Michigan? In Michigan? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm I raced the Detroit Dragway. I raced at Motor City. I raced at Public. I raced at Martin 131. Um, I raced at Stanton. It was called McBride at one time. Okay. And it's like that was the first meeting in the was the McBride for a man's race. And, uh, I used to love to go to the Martin 131. Why is that? Which was outside of Kalamazoo. Mm-hmm. Um, because... I had the Papa Hot Rodding Championships there. Okay. I won that a lot of time. <laughs> Fan favorite, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so, real estate at 88, we heard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I finished my course, I passed my course, and now getting ready to set the date for my state test, which is like going before the bar. Okay, oh wow. And you, and, and you take that test, and then then you have to go and be hired by a real estate 
how broke mm -hmm. to work under a broker. You can't mm -hmm. just come out here and sell on your own. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's just, I, I love real estate. Most of my money was made in real estate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, wow. There you go. A little note. Is it um, residential, commercial? Commercial. Yeah. Never made a lot of money in residential. Well, okay. We lived, you know. Mm -hmm. now, I have, you know. Later, I have flipped some houses that made money on that. Yeah. And uh, that's one thing I like to do, too. I like to. I've never done a whole house, but I like to. I like to get small furniture off the side of the road and flip that and turn it. You know, paint it or put new hardware, or whatever. I've flipped a couple houses in the last couple of years. You have to find the right one at the right price. Mm -hmm. it looks like it might be in the right neighborhood, mm -hmm. and, and you get in there and do it. And, and it's handy because all of the mobilities, the build engines, and run machines. Gives you the same. Yeah, the transfers. The in carpentry and mm -hmm. mechanical yep. and water heaters and sprinkler systems and stuff. You know, it's yes. all in the same yes. vein. Yes. Yes. It's all nuts and bolts. Yeah, trade work. I, I I feel like there's going to be a wave of trade work coming back because there's nobody can find good jobs out there. They're starting to realize the jobs that have always been will always be. Well. Just thinking back when I was a kid, nobody wanted to be a mechanic. It was a grease monkey job, and you were lucky if you could make 50, 60 bucks a week, where a, a, a mm -hmm. good job paid 80 to 100, so mm -hmm. you were almost like half paid. And now, they, they, you go into the dealership, it's $125 an hour. You don't have to tell me. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you got the training, of course, it takes more training now mm -hmm. because you got to know all about the computers. Right. And I mean, these are nice jobs and they're not real dirty either. Right. I mean, this is working on those good cars. This is a big part of why I'm here, here with Phil and on the mission that we're on, is because I did grow up in the Midwest where men like you, Phil, real men, hard workers, you have to go out and find what you need and yet you're out there. My dad was outside fixing, working on the car all the time. Um, but then I grew up and I moved away from that and nobody does anything themselves. Nobody knows how to do anything. I can't find somebody to help me. I'm willing to get under there. Like, I'll do it. Can we do it together? We'll figure it out. Um, but I don't get anywhere, so I go to the fire zone or the where you know whatever's local, and that's very frustrating for me because I know it could be done at much lesser expense. I could be learning it. I could be doing some of the simpler things. Um, so when I met Bill, he, we took on a project. A whole society that is still doing all of that. This is all these people that have come here from especially from Mexico, mm -hmm. they don't have the money mm -hmm. to deal with dealerships at mm -hmm. $25 an hour. Right. And they, these people, and I see it all the time because when I go to the parts house, I can see the Hispanics in there buying the parts, yep. and they're fixing their own car. Absolutely. They're learning how to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that, but that used to be the group I came from. Right. We fixed our own car. Yep. And I really relate to that because I can understand. I didn't have the money, even going to the dealership in the 50s was mm -hmm. expensive if you put a grade in right. on the curve. Right, um, cost of living at the time, absolutely. So, but now it's actually gotten worse. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> So here I, I see all those guys, they, they put all their own water pumps on, all yep. their air conditioning stuff, everything, all their own brakes. But then that's how you know the car so well. That's how you learn because you're not going to make some of those mistakes twice. Some of them are so big or so expensive or what it took, back to coming full circle, what it took to get them. Get, you know, you're not going to mess that up again. You got it. That's, that's how you learn. That's how you get it in there. When I first started my own shop in 1956, I had never touched an automatic transmission. Mm -hmm. They were like a little taboo, you know, they were kind of strange things, you know. And there was few people that actually did. There was transmission shops and transmission guys. And so I have this shop and my brother and I are running it. And we got, if we don't make it, we don't eat. It's as simple mm -hmm. as that. And there was two families, my family and his family, mm -hmm. were working out of this shop. And this guy comes in with this... 49 holes with a hydromatic transmission in it and they wanted to know would we 
could we refill and it was slipping. Mm -hmm. And I said, absolutely. <laughs> With full confidence, you heard that, right? <laughs> so, he, I did, I, we haven't done the job ever more. I said, I'll get, I'll get on it sometime tonight, maybe the next couple of days we'll have it. And he said, how much is it going to be? I said, 50 bucks. You flew it, parts. Unless there's something broke, you know, so that would take care of the, the bands and the clutches and all the seals mm -hmm. and the 14 or 15 quarts of fluid. Mm -hmm. I said, if there's anything else in there that's wrong, then you have to pay that extra, but you'll see the broken part. Mm -hmm. So I got my motor manual out. I called the tool man. There was a couple, two or three little small things that you had to have special. Yep. I called him up. Mr. Kennedy was his name, and he run those out to me. And then... Put the car up on jacks that night, pulled the doors down. <laughs> oh, I bought a transmission jack to get it okay, out. Okay, okay. That jack is over the antique door. We'll have to take another loop. Okay. I saw. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes sir. And I uh, pulled that transmission out, uh, and I cleaned the big long bench off. The bench was about from here to the wall. I cleaned it off completely, and on this end, I started, and I took the transmission apart piece by piece, just the way the manual said. Mm -hmm. Laid the pieces out, you know, and all the stuff. And I, I, you could see what was wrong. It needed seals. They were all hard, leaking, and the clutches were worn down. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, and I got up and I went down to Ralph's Auto Parts and bought all the pieces that mm. I need and a case of transmission fluid was like 30 cents a quart. Yeah. <laughs> so, it made it so much <laughs> Put it all back together yeah. and it worked perfect. Wow. It, wow. it, it wasn't first, anything first time charm. It was just be sure you take it apart according to the sequence of events that the manual said. So you read the manual first. And, yeah, the manual first and had it right there. Still have yeah. that manual too. <laughs> That's and, great. But that got me into something. I, I realized how simple it was, and I and and of course that was a good price. But I made money, mm -hmm. and uh, they began to bring those things to me. And then I found out that you could change the planetary gears, and you could change the gear ratios in them, and then you could actually raise the pressure and make them shift harder. First thing you know, I was setting these transmissions up for guys to go racing. Uh, of course, <laughs> that's your touch. Never having to <laughs> right? Okay. Yep, that's great. Okay, so here's one for you. How old were you when you learned how to drive a uh, manual? How old? How old were you when you learned how to drive a manual, a stick shift? Well, I learned with a man. Yes, how old? Oh, uh, let's see. 14. Okay. I got you beat. Younger? Yes. Well, <laughs> my dad, my stepdad, let me drive the truck around on the dairy some. So I guess, I mean, I'm told 14 is when I went on the when you, okay with my learner's permit. Oh, oh, it was early Somebody then. Somebody okay. sitting in the other seat. Okay. That's what I thought you meant. But, <laughs> oh, 11, 10, yeah, yeah. 12, out on the farm. Exactly, yeah. It's 37 Ford pickup. Okay. Yeah. All right. You got that around somewhere? Yeah. You looking? <laughs> yep, yep. Me too. I was. Was, um, I was 12. I was 12. My mom had a friend over. I want. I wanted to go to the store. I asked to walk. The friend said, "You can take my car." And it, of course, it was a stick shift. My mom's like, "She don't know how to. You know, she's she's played a little. She don't know how to drive." She's, he said, "Hey, if she can get it out of here, I don't mind." So I said, "All right, give it a try. If you if you can make it to the store, it was only a mile away. If you can make it to the store and back, then you did it." So I did. <laughs> I made it. Oh yep, yep, and that was it. But just uh, just like you, prior to that, when I would be in the passenger seat, she would let me shift so that I got a feel for the gears, and I, you know, I would be able to understand that piece separate way before I even drove. So. Yeah, yeah. So we always had. They were all six shift back. Yes. My, my real dad would let me shift the car. I if I sat in the front seat, he let me shift through the H pad. Yeah. I knew yep. how to shift from well, for, for him. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I never. The other thing I'll never forget. They just got a thirty-five four. My, my dad and mom. And, and this is about 1938, and it's real early. The car's a couple of years old, but they're in very good shape, they're like brand new. And we're driving down the highway in the near in the back seat, 
<laughs> we never sat down in the back seat. Well, Looking out the back the two seats where we could see the gauges and look out the, the windshield. Mm -hmm. The mom is sitting over here in the front seat. And my dad had been running about 35 miles an hour. That, the 40 was really fast back then. Mm -hmm. Most of the streets were real narrow and mm -hmm. two cars going like this. You know, so mm -hmm. Most of it, it didn't, you didn't get the 55, 60 miles an hour to get out of open highway. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so he says, Helen, I'm going to show you 60 miles an hour, oh. about 35. He just stepped down that forward, that speed on, on there, we just went right up there. 50 was straight up, he just went right by that 50, went right down there, and this thing got to 60, my mother was having a hissy fit. <laughs> you know, it's all this down, you're going to kill us all. <laughs> I, 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 I just want that hand to just keep going. They couldn't go fast enough to make it. I, I I knew I, Was that it right I then? Go fast. <laughs> I went plenty fast. I've been 323 miles an hour mm -hmm. in 4.7 seconds from a dead stop. That was my best. That is amazing. Amazing. Mm -mm. So, on that note, not necessarily your biggest win or your fastest speed or anything like that, but what's your most memorable moment in all, over all these years? It's, uh, we built this museum, we moved here in 82, and by 84 it was up and running, and I was building my house, and I was just kind of took some time off from racing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any new, the best car I had was built in 19, the fall of 1980. Mm -hmm. okay. I called it the 81 car, mm -hmm. and it was in here in the museum, mm -hmm. in a static display. And Art Malone, my dear friend from Tampa, who is now, went to school from the fifth grade. Wow. So he came up here and he said, this is the summer of 84. He says, what do you say we go to the U.S. Nationals in Indy? I said, Art, that sounds like a heck of a good idea. I'll call NHR and give us some tickets. He says, I wasn't thinking about watching. He said, I was thinking about maybe racing. I said, well, I don't have anything like that. I said, I don't have any new races. We don't have to worry about trying to win. He says, maybe we could just qualify. Go back into the building, pick you out the best car you got, and I'll buy a brand new engine and clutch assembly uh -huh. for the modern stuff. Okay. I said, that would cost about 20000 He says, that's all right. I mean, that wouldn't even smell. It wow. That wouldn't even buy the floor. <laughs> so we got a nice new engine and clutch, put it in the car, and we head to Indy. And they they just laughing at us. Here's all the big proteins up on the tarmac, you know. And they put us down in the grass <laughs> off to the side, you know. And they were all talking about the two old dinosaurs down there trying to make an old outdated car. And on the third run, mm -hmm. we said top speed of the meat. Wow. And they realized that we weren't there for the beer. Yeah. <laughs> we waited, waited through that field and beat all the fast guys and won the race. Yeah. And Malone says, let's go to the fun. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> this is before, there were like four races in those. Okay. I said, well, that engine's wore out. He said, I'll just buy another one. <laughs> Oh, wow. made a lot of money in real estate. Yeah, but ah, I'm said, seeing well, all of that property north of Tampa that was just cypress swamps okay. mm -hmm. for like two dollars an acre, and that's all that all houses. Wow. <laughs> they they put that big canal in and it drains it all. He, he must have known something. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> we got another engine. We hit it to the bottom, and son of a gun, we win again. Wow. And the mm -hmm. one says, you ain't got any business being retired. Let's build a new car <laughs> and go for the championship. So we built Swamp Rat 29 <clears throat> and won the world championships in 1985. And then I, got this, I had this dream about enclosing the front wheels under a cover and making it more streamlined. And then we built the car here, Swamp Rat 30, and that's the one that's so, that's so neat they put it in the Smithsonian. Oh, yes. I didn't know you had one there. And we, 
brought that car out in 86. We were the first car over 270 miles an hour and won the world championships, and then the car was put in the Smithsonian afterwards. I mean, that's the biggest honor you can possibly get. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. And all because of a long uh, childhood buddy wanted to get out there one more time. Yeah. <laughs> that's let's go, great. Let's go, well, let's just go to Andy. Right? And he knew you weren't going to say no. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, you've been interviewed for what, 30, 40 years? Just, I, oh, you've had a lot of questions asked. Well, I, I started in June of 50, and this was 20. I think that's a, this June will be 70 years in the sport. Is there anything everybody misses? Anything you're always like, why don't they ever ask me that? Have you been asked everything under the sun? Well, you know, there's a lot of things about Not me. personal, of course. No. <laughs> I, I, I have it. I love for economics because I am an accountant. Mm-hmm. And I was an accountant. My stepfather steered me from accountants into cars. Mm-hmm. And that's good. But the accountant works to our own in-house bookkeeping. Absolutely. But also... I have studied archaeology. That is really cool. I I can tell you things about all the beginnings of all of this. What we're what this little planet we live on. That, That's that fascinating. We don't even talk about it in school. Uh huh. Well, the the things so learned in school. Yeah. Me, I like to know where did this all come from. Mm-hmm. What is this all about? Right, right. What did it look uh, like first? There's so much history on this planet that's suppressed mm-hmm. because they just don't the people don't need to know that mm-hmm. it's not that they don't want to know mm-hmm. it's the government doesn't think they need to know yep. or it'll be an outbreak of hysteria or whatever yeah, if they do with that poster see that red poster with the yes ball, I do that's that's that is part of my uh, interest in archaeology because they, they play a big part in it. I agree with that. For, for millions of years. I agree with that. There's and, a lot of very unique uh, artwork on uh, you know on the stones and everything that is clearly not from that time. No. no. Yep. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> like the artifacts up. They, they broke off. You know what a geode is? I do. I have one right here. You want, that's a you want, that's a petrified rock, also, isn't See, it? We, I mean, a petrified. If we saw it through that, yes. there'd be an inside in there. Yep, crystal. They saw it through one of these. Now, this is millions of years old. Mm. They saw it through one of these in California, and there was a spark plug inside of it. It wasn't a champion. Wow. <laughs> a spark plug similar wow. to like we made. Right, right. Now that's high technology. That's amazing, absolutely. Now, what's that all about? Right, exactly. There's no denying that. Yeah. That's amazing that's really cool and that is a petrified tree uh, that is a, a whole section of a petrified small and that was in 1965 uh, the Greer Ranch ordered the petrified form mm-hmm. I think it's been annexed now several property mm-hmm. but they made money there they would go out there with a bulldozer and just scoop the ground and it would just turn up all this stuff and then you would weigh in at the gate mm-hmm. and then you weigh out yeah. with so much a pound, I think right. like seven cents a pound or something like that. Right. And I filled my 65 Dodge truck up with petrified wood and that wow. would be you're allowed to bring equipment out? Or you, yeah, I mean, you it. I, no, I mean, uh, how'd you get that out? <laughs> I, I was by myself until this day. I don't know how. I, <laughs> I have to assume it's heavier. The tailgate of my pickup truck, that's heavy. It, it's got to be. It's got to be amazingly heavy. Uh, and I had lots of small pieces, which I had built this really nice uh, bar in our home in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And of course, it went up with the house. Mm-hmm. But the guy that bought the house didn't like it, so sometime later, see, he's had it now 30 some years, he tore the bar out, but he didn't throw the, the petrified wood away, and he called me on the phone and said, you want all this petrified wood, Max, you can have it. Yeah. So I ran down and got a little piece over in the closet, and uh, That's I made something out of it sometime. Yeah, you will. <laughs> you saw plenty, you got a lot of hobbies it's and... priceless today, but you can't get your hands on it. Oh, uh, yeah. No, none of that's ever taken out of that mm-hmm. now. Right. Right, and yours is this right there. 
That's awesome. Very, very so cool. Pretty too. I shined up. Oh, wow. Absolutely. It's just be drop dead gorgeous, which is, you know, it is. the most beautiful things to me are all the stuff that God made. Mm-hmm. I'm I, coming from the woods. I appreciate nature and animals so much, and Nothing like being it. like one with with the We're earth. So fortunate. There are so many places in this universe that we could have landed, you know, which might not be near as nice. Mm-hmm. This is a really special place. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right. I mean, even though there's maybe millions and millions of planets thinking around stars out there, mm-hmm. it's, it would be, uh, they're not all like this. That's right. <laughs> yep. We know that even in our own, we know about our own system, and this is the only one here that's like this in this, all these nine planets. Mm-hmm. This is the only one that's, mm-hmm. this one that's really, I mean, we could actually go to Venus or go to Mars and be there, but it wouldn't be with this kind of comfort. Right. They refer to it as the Goldilocks uh, planet. Not too hot, not too cold. It's just right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, then there's some other things about it. This, this pill that gives us the season. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, but you're in Florida. Where do you go for your seasons? Well, we did, it, it's so hard to get them anymore. That is, that's a and very true statement. happening right now, whether you're aware of this or not, you know, the North Pole is moving. It's moving 55 kilometers a year now toward Moscow. Mm. We're getting, we're having a pole shift, and that's what's really going on. It's not all this hubble of blue about mm. the climate change that we're called. We ain't doing nothing. Yeah, we're shifting. The Earth's orbit, there's two things that's happened. We're going into an elliptical orbit now. Mm-hmm. Always we were a complete mm-hmm. circle. We're flying. We're on a slight elliptical, so that mm-hmm. means there's times when it's further away from the sun yep. and closer to the sun. And then the other thing is the poles moving a little bit, so that means the whole climate's going to change. It could be that puts it's pushing this part closer to the equator, so our yeah. winters may go completely away here, but if they move too close to Moscow, look what that'll do. They, they can't have Moscow at the North Pole. <laughs> that could be a problem. <laughs> be a massive, there's going to have to be massive uh, population changes. You know, mm-hmm. Absolutely. That. Absolutely. At the bottom of the planet is where the real problem is, because as that pole moves off of Antarctica mm-hmm. and towards for New Zealand, mm-hmm. New Zealand will become a wasteland. Yep. But what about that five mile thick chunk of ice that's on Antarctica? Mm-hmm. What do you think is going to happen to it? Mm-hmm. All that, yeah, it'll start melting. It's going to melt. Mm-hmm. And that'll raise the oceans at least. Two yes. Feet. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be play havoc on the coastal sea. Yeah, absolutely. So it's all gonna, of that'll change the whole thing. And NASA, this is all coming up. It's all coming out of there. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've read, I've read a lot about all of this stuff, everything you're saying. I'm, I'm right with you. Yeah. Yeah. I keep up with all of that kind of stuff. So my interests actually go beyond drag race. I believe there was a few things in there. They might get pushed to the side because this is your life. But, yeah, everybody's got a few things they like to dabble in. Yeah, those are very cool things. So, uh, you heard a little bit about what we're trying to do. We're trying to to really get out and get the stories about the old days, the hard times, the effort, the passion. Um, that's a big part of what we're doing. I'm pushing for women to be brave, be strong, get out there, try stuff. For the most part, generally speaking, yes, we don't have the same muscle, but there's tons of things we can do. You know, so I'm I'm pushing for the women to be strong and brave and just even try. You'd be surprised. Um, so with all the she's being modest. <laughs> being modest, she actually got underneath of her jeep and rebuilt the rear uh, rear assembly, uh, the gears of her modern day jeep because it needed new bearings. Being very modest. With those, that's, with, a, that's a tough job. It was a long job. It's not easy. 
Yeah. Um, thank you. That was kind of, Bill's been teaching me how, you know, I'm supposed to be, he's supposed to be teaching me how to build muscle cars, but my car's a piece of crap. So he, instead we spend a lot of time under my car, but it's all valuable time. So I absolutely love it and appreciate it. And knowledge is power. So that's kind of my, what I'm pushing in this agenda. Um, so with that said, do you get any advice for us or, or a question or anything like that you could turn back? Never stop learning. Never close your mind. Never think you know it all. Absolutely. That's it. Yeah. Um, I learn something new every day. I, I, I'm the same way. I, as soon as I get a bit of information, I say that out loud. I'm like, well, there was my information for the day. You know, I got something. <laughs> your mind going good. And, uh, and if, you, if your mind is just like a muscle, if you tied your hand up, it wouldn't take long. It would just, just get mm -hmm. low and useless. Yep. And if you don't use your mind, the same thing happens. I agree. I agree. So, so that we'll wrap it up. We'll let you get on with your life. It certainly was a pleasure, and I enjoyed it. I always like to visit the old days. Yes. Talk about how it was, you know. And, uh, there's still a lot of opportunity out there. Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, you really, it's really busy out there. I don't know if this is something you would do or not, but I have a really competitive spirit. I wondered if you would, if I could challenge you to um, a reaction time test. Is it working? It, it was working when we were here earlier. <laughs> we'll do that. Thank you so much. I think there's a, some young kids out here that want to short interview. Their, their we can, we can we can sit around absolutely. And, uh, Thank you so much, Don. <laughs> Hot Rod Hannah. 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 Uh, I spent nine years in the artillery and 60 years drag racing. That was the end of Nine years in artillery. For modern technology, I'd be totally deaf. Mm -hmm. I was in the military. Did you catch that part yet? Not, not in, uh, I was in uh, the army for three years. Was you? Mm -hmm. My service was a long time ago. I got my discharge in 56. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was born in 78. Yeah. What were you doing in 78? Who were you beating in 78? In 78, I was running the Swamp Rat 24. That's the blue and white car. And that was the year that I I didn't have any sponsorship. With That's the, the Navy. On the front of the car. And they yes. Just, they hate Mm -hmm. I, I, I watched a couple interviews about that story. And when I was looking for the rail out there, is, is it the same one? It's now gold trim? Or is there not the blue same rail? It's blue and white, but I thought the cross was white, but it's gold. It's always, well, the cross is kind of a, it's a kind of a metal. Yeah, okay, it was oh, always that way. It's never been changed. Okay, okay, I thought it, I thought it had. I was curious about that. Yeah.